in the gospel, we hear our, G- our Lord Jesus proclaiming that he is the bread of life, come down from heaven. And unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life within you. You have no part of me, he says. So we're going to reflect on that gospel passage just a little bit in a few moments, but I'd like to begin with something to really open your minds and open your hearts to just really understand exactly not only what it is that we're going to be entering into a deeper understanding of, but who it is. And as our Lord dwells with us here in his holy sanctuary in the tabernacle, we maintain a state of prayer, we maintain a state of reverence. And so I'd like to share with you today one of the stories from this amazing book, Eucharistic Miracles by Joan Carol Cruz, and a special acknowledgement to her and the amazing work that she has done putting this together. Because we're going to see in the story that I'm going to show you exactly who the Eucharist really is and how it is acknowledged not only by us, but the rest of creation itself in a very unique way, especially in this particular story. And this particular story takes place in 1280 in Ofita, Italy. And why am I beginning with this? Well, it's because throughout the course of our 2,000 year history, there have been, as this book acknowledges, many miracles of the Eucharist that have taken place. Now, sadly, the majority of them have happened as a result of sacrilege, where the priest was either doubting the real presence or someone was receiving in a state of mortal sin, or the Eucharist was flat out abused. Now, when, the deliberate, when there's a deliberate abuse of the Eucharist, I don't know if many folks know this, but if one willingly defiles the Eucharist, not by receiving in a state of mortal sin, but if someone physically defiles the Eucharist, say the, the Eucharist was stolen from our church, God forbid, and abused in a black mass done by Satanists, something along those lines, that if they repented of their sin, we would first need permission from the Holy Father to absolve that individual of such sin because it is among the most severe that can be committed. So the bishop himself would have to contact the Holy Father in Rome and the Holy Father would have to grant his absolution through the bishop. And so we see exactly how serious such an act is And unfortunately, acts like that have happened throughout the course of our history, and miracles have taken place as a result of it, where our Lord is saying to people, like he did to St. Paul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you abusing me? But even more so, he is saying, yes, this is truly me. Do not doubt, but believe. Now, as I said, this miracle took place in Afita, Italy, in the year 1280. A woman named Riccarella, the wife of Giacomo Stasio, deeply afflicted by her unhappy marriage, had tried everything at her disposal to win the love of her husband. Finally, someone claimed to know of a way for her to achieve the harmony she desired. Riccarella was advised to receive the Holy Eucharist, convey it to her kitchen, and heat it over the fire until a powder was obtained. This she would put into the food or drink of her husband, who would then grow to love and respect her. This was advice that she had gotten from a witch. In desperation for relief from her sad situation, Riccarella attended Holy Mass, received the Eucharist, and secretly let the hose fall from her mouth into the top of her dress. After taking it home, she placed it on a copo, a semicircular tile-shaped like item that was placed on the tile over a fire. As soon as the sacred host was heated, instead of it turning into powder, it began to turn into a piece of bloody flesh. Horrified at what was taking place, Riccarella attempted to stop the process by throwing ashes and melted wax on the tile, but without success. The tile soon bore a huge smear of blood and the flesh remained perfectly sound. Frantic for a way to dispose of the evidence of her sacrilege, Riccarella took a linen tablecloth decorated with silk embroidery and lace and wrapped it around the tile and the bloody hose. Carrying the bundle outside, she went to the stable and buried it in the place where garbage from the house and filth from the stalls were heaped. That evening, when her husband Giacomo approached the stable with his horse, the animal refused to enter. 
contrary to its usual docile behavior, and remained stubborn despite a severe beating from its master. At last it relented, but instead of proceeding directly, it entered sideways, facing the heap of garbage, until at last it fell on its knees. Giacomo became violent at the sight and accused his wife of placing a spell on the stable that made the animal fearful of entering it. Riccarella, of course, denied everything and remained silent about the cause of the difficulty. For seven years, the Blessed Sacrament remained hidden beneath the garbage, and for that period of time, the animals went in or out sideways, appearing to show respect for the heap of refuse. So this is seven years. Every single time, not just the horse, but any animal is going in or out of this place, they're entering sideways, facing where our Lord is buried. Instead of the peace Riccarella had attempted to gain from her sacrilege, she was instead tormented day and night with remorse for, for her sin. Finally, she decided to confess what she had done to a priest from the monastery of San Agostino. Kneeling for confession, Riccarella found herself unable to speak through her sobs, even though the priest encouraged her to be unafraid and to be at peace. Finally, still being unable to speak of the sacrilege, she asked the priest for help. Father Giacomo, after lifting all of the sins possible, said, I have told you all the sins that can be committed. I don't know what your fault could be unless you killed God. This is my sin, she said. I have killed God. Riccarella then said her story of her sacrilege. Surprised at what was finally disclosed to him, Father Giacomo absolved Riccarella, encouraged her to be at peace, and arranged to have the host removed from the garbage pile without delay. Now, Father G now, the priest did not break the seal of confession here by telling the story. It was Riccarella who told the story of her confession, which she can do. So, nobody be nervous about that. <laughs> now, after vesting suitably, he journeyed to the stable and, unconcerned about disease or sickness, began to remove the garbage and filth. To his surprise, he discovered that the tile, the bloody host, and the tablecloth were not contaminated and looked as if they had been recently buried. Father Giacomo then carried the tile, the host, and the tablecloth to his monastery. Here's the tablecloth. There's the tile. And follow some illustrations depicting the story. And that host, that miraculous host, continues to be cared for, as well as many other of the Eucharistic miracles that have taken place throughout our history. So again, this is just to paint a picture, of again, exactly who and what the Eucharist is, the center and the height of who we are. In order to perpetuate the sacrifice of the cross throughout the ages and to make it possible for us to grow in Trinitarian life unto sanctity, Christ provided himself as nourishment, presence, and pledge of future glory, says the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 1323. Now the source and summit, again, of the ecclesial life, the life of the Church, is the Eucharist. It is the sacrament of love. Now God doesn't possess love the way that we do. He is love. He is the embodiment of it. And he gives that very gift fully in himself in the Blessed Sacrament, which is also a sign of unity, a bond of charity, a paschal banquet in which Christ is consumed, where the mind is filled with grace and the pledge of future glory is given to us. And so every time we receive the Eucharist, we are asking for peace and unity. Is that not part of our Eucharistic liturgy? when we're praying for peace and unity amongst all of us, that we continue to be of one mind and one heart, faithful to the dogma and the doctrine that is our Catholic faith given to us by Christ himself, especially the real presence in the Eucharist that we are meant to guard, that we are meant to protect and reverence, that heaven forbid stories like this that we have just heard cease to take place. And in the Eucharistic celebration, we already unite ourselves with the heavenly liturgy and anticipate eternal life. As we discussed last time, we talked about how the Mass is heaven on earth. 
how we see through the book of Revelation everything that is taking place within the heavenly Jerusalem, within God's temple, within his sanctuary, in the heavenly kingdom, is revealed to us in the Mass because it is where we take one step out of time and one into eternity, where we are participating in the heavenly liturgy. And so it is in the heavenly banquet that we receive the Eucharist because that is, of course, what a banquet is. It is where we come to dine. It is where we come to feast and we come to celebrate. And so let's see a little bit more about exactly what this sacrament is called. Something that to help us just reflect a little bit more on our Eucharistic consecration. How many of you here are doing the consecration? Are reading the book? Fantastic, fantastic. So happy to hear, so happy to see that. Now the Eucharist comes from the Greek word Eucharistia, which means thanksgiving. That is why, again, the Mass is called the Mass of Thanksgiving. We come to offer sacrifice where we relive. It's not a representation, it's a representation. That hyphen in there is absolutely critical. It's not a representation of Jesus' Paschal mystery, his passion, death, resurrection. It is a representation of it where we relive it, where the sacrifice of the cross is placed before us and we are there before him on Calvary. And so it is not something symbolic, it is something that we continuously live. We are continuously living the passion, death, and resurrection of our Lord in the Mass and in our hearts. We are meant to be doing so as well, keeping in mind all of the experiences that we have in this life. Whenever we enter what I call a passion moment, where we're suffering a trial, some type of hardship in this life, where it's difficult to understand in the moment exactly what it is we are experiencing, but even more so why we are experiencing what we are experiencing. We need to call to mind that this passion moment will not last. It may seem like it's lasting forever. I'm sure Jesus felt the same way during his passion, suffering um, the most brutal torture and suffering anyone in history will ever experience. He probably felt in his humanity like it would last forever. But he recalled to mind in his humanity that it wouldn't, that he would eventually come to the resurrection moment. And that's the reminder for us in the Eucharist that even though we are suffering a passion moment, the resurrection moment of that experience will eventually come. It hasn't always been like this. We need to remind ourselves. Therefore, it's not always going to be like this. In the Lord's Supper, we come to the breaking of the bread. Now, we see before us here at the Ambo, the liturgy of the word taking place in the story of Jesus encountering the disciples on the road to Emmaus. They're pondering, the two disciples are pondering in their hearts the events that had just taken place in Jerusalem. They are saddened because they thought that Jesus was the Messiah who was going to come in the way that they expected, that he would come with ferocious military might, overthrow the Roman Empire, and reestablish the throne of David. But then they hear that some of their companions, the women who had gone to the tomb, said that they saw him alive. And they hadn't seen him yet, and so they're pondering in their hearts what all of this might be, which prevents them from recognizing Jesus because of their lack of faith. And so when he appears to them, He's breaking open the scriptures, explaining to them exactly all of the oracles of the prophets, saying that this is what the Messiah was going to come and do. This is something that he had to do. It was all foretold. But yet, they do not fully understand the proper interpretation of the scriptures. And so therefore, they are prevented from understanding. As at times in our sufferings, we are prevented from understanding why we are experiencing what we are. But then the resurrection moment happens and then we have a deeper understanding. Okay, this is why I was going through what I was going through. This is what I needed to learn. This is something that I needed to understand. But it then comes to the breaking of the bread in the story of Emmaus. And what happens then? At the breaking of the bread is when they recognize our Lord. They recognize our Lord when in the breaking of the bread. I love the story of Scott Hahn's conversion. Anybody know who Scott Hahn is? I hope a number of us do. Great, fantastic. 
Because the Lamb's Supper, the book that we were referring to last time quite a bit, is, was written by him. And in the beginning of that book, he talks about the Mass. He talks about his experience there. And if anybody knows the story, you'll know that as a Pentecostal preacher, he was raised to despise Catholic Christians, thinking that we were idolaters, that the Mass was the worst form of idolatry and sacrifice that there could be. And so he never attended a Mass, but he was studying scriptures for the majority of his life, but the book of Revelation is the one that he was having particular trouble with. And so he started reading up on the church fathers, the early Christians, the first ones, us, the Catholic Christians. And he would see the terminology that was being used, such as liturgy, banquet, sacrifice, all kinds of things like that. And he related all of that language to the book of Revelation. And so he finally got up the courage to go to a, a mass. And all of the parts of the mass, he's noticing, oh, this is from Isaiah. This is from Ezekiel. This is from Jeremiah. This is the Psalms. Wow, the mass is really in the Bible. And then when it comes to the elevation of the host of the Eucharist, what does he say? Something he never thought he would say. My Lord, my God, that really is you. He understood that the book of Revelation was being revealed in the Mass. And he recognized our Lord in the breaking of the bread and is now an amazing theologian of our time. Because the Eucharist is also an assembly. It is where we come together as the church militant to gather together, to unite, to pray for peace, and to receive everything that the Lord wants to give to us to fulfill the mission and the ministry that we all have, which is the salvation of souls for all of us, but how that is to take place is unique for each one of us and whatever our vocations may be. And so we remember and relive our Lord's passion and resurrection, which is the holy sacrifice, because the Mass, again, is called the Mass of Thanksgiving, but the Mass is also a sacrifice. We ask that our Lord be pleased with the sacrifice. Some of the, one of the prayers that the priest prays in silence, may our, Lord be seen, may our sacrifice be acceptable in your sight this day, O Lord. May it be pleasing to you because we are offering ourselves in union with Christ as members of his body because Christ is our head, our heavenly bridegroom. As members of his body, we are offering ourselves up upon the altar of sacrifice with him in union with him. Now, the priest does so in a unique way because he says, this is not the body of Jesus. He says, this is my body, which is given for you. But in a very unique way, through your baptismal priesthood, you are also offering yourselves upon the altar in sacrifice for whatever intentions you may be offering for the intercessions we pray for in the Mass. For all of that, we are placing ourselves upon the altar as the Eucharistic assembly with Jesus and offering ourselves up to the Father in union with him in the holy sacrifice, the divine liturgy, that we may receive the most blessed sacrament in a worthy way, in a state of grace, so that we ourselves may be transformed more and more in the image and likeness of Christ through a holy communion, the holy mass. And so we're going to just discuss a little bit of how the Eucharist was revealed and prefigured throughout salvation history. We're going to repeat a couple of things from last time just so it becomes fresh in our memory. And we're just going to see all of the different moments throughout the history of the Old Covenant in which the Eucharist is revealed, prefigured, anticipated. Because the covenant of Christ, the new and eternal covenant, is the fulfillment of all of the old covenants. Now in total, anybody remember how many covenants there have been? Anybody? Anybody remember? Oh gosh, I'm a horrible teacher. <laughs> Six, that's right. So the sacrifice of Christ, the covenant that he comes to establish with us here in the Holy Mass is the new and eternal covenant meaning that no other covenant is necessary for establishment because it is the one that is eternal. Now firstly, we look to the bread and the wine of Melchizedek's offering. Now we've heard of Melchizedek, is anybody who's heard, not heard of Melchizedek? Is that, a, is that a first time thing for anybody? Okay, well Melchizedek 
People ask me, and when they see the cassock, you know, Father, are you a member of an order? And I say, in a humorous way, of course, yes, I'm a member of the order of Melchizedek. Because it's true. Jesus himself says that you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Not of the order of St. Peter, not of the order of St. Paul, but you are a priest in the order of Melchizedek. And why is that? We see from Genesis chapter 14, King Melchizedek of Salem, which would later become Jerusalem, brought out to Abraham bread and wine, for he was a priest of God most high. Now, at the heart of the Eucharistic celebration, as we know, are the bread and the wine that become Christ's body, blood, soul, and divinity. So we see in the offering of bread and wine, not any animal sacrifice upon a brazen altar, but through the offering of bread and wine as an expression of thanksgiving, Melchizedek, who is both king and priest, a very unique role, offers to God in thanksgiving for Abraham's victory over his enemies. Now, the book of Genesis tells us that Abraham was outnumbered when he went out to battle against his enemies, but yet, by the grace of God, he was victorious. And so, the, the king of the city of peace, because that's what Jerusalem means, it means city of peace, offers in thanksgiving to God for Abraham's deliverance from his enemies, for his victory. We give thanks to the Creator for the bread and the wine in the Mass, which signify the goodness of creation. We talked a little bit about that last time. When I'm offering the bread, what do I say? Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness, we have received the bread we offer you, fruit of the earth and work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. So we are acknowledging that it is a gift to us by God that we are offering back to him, fruit of the earth, but also work of human hands. We are expressing the sanctity of labor, because our Lord himself labored for six days in creation, not six 24-hour periods, but he labored throughout the course of six days. And so he is showing the sanctity of labor in his actions, and we are acknowledging that through our own work. And so it was the work of human hands that fashioned the bread, but the elements of it all comes from creation given to us by God. And then we come to the offering of the wine. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become our spiritual drink. And so that is something that we are doing in the Mass, giving thanksgiving to the Creator and having all of creation join with us in offering worship and praise. I mentioned last time that the high priest, when he would enter the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was, how many times a year could he do that? Once. Anybody remember what that day was called? Yom Kippur, which also means day of what? Atonement. Very good. Oh, I'm not such a horrible teacher. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Thank you. So, very good. When he would enter into the Holy of Holies to offer blood sacrifice and burn incense before the Ark of the Covenant, the vestments that he wore symbolize all of creation, so all of creation would enter into the Holy of Holies with him to offer thanks and sacrifice to the Creator. And when we see the plants and all of the, all of the beautiful decorations that we have here in the sanctuary, it's not simply meant to look beautiful, but that is the key part of it because God is about everything that's good, true, and beautiful, but it symbolizes all of creation that's here with us to give praise and worship to the Creator. That's why all of this is here, okay? Now Melchizedek's offering of bread and wine to Abraham is a prefiguring of the church's own offering. He's offering, again, not the blood sacrifice of animals, but what? Bread and wine. So we see how Melchizedek, who is priest, prophet, and king, something that we all receive in our, the anointings of our baptism, is a prefigurement of the church. The church is offering in the new and eternal covenant, the holy sacrifice of the mass. So we see how all of salvation history comes together. We see the plan of the creator. How none of this, all of these parallels, all of these prefigurements, it's not a coincidence. 
Because I don't believe in coincidences. And so something like this is all part of the divine plan of the Father. Because Christ, like Melchizedek was, is a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Psalm 110. So Jesus himself, the high priest, the one who enters the Holy of Holies in the kingdom of heaven upon his ascension, is a priest like I am because I am a priest of Jesus Christ. We are priests of the order of Melchizedek. And now the Passover and the Exodus. Now we've talked quite a bit about the Passover last time. Now what exactly was the Passover? Can any, show, anyone want to answer for us exactly what the Passover was? Come on, let me see some, let me see some hands raised and I'll call on you. What was the Passover? That's exactly right. And who passed over them? The angel of death. Very good. So exactly what she said. She said that the Passover was when the firstborn in Egypt were struck down at the coming of the angel of death, the final plague of Egypt. But the Israelites were spared because of the blood of the Paschal lamb, the male lamb without blemish, who was offered in sacrifice for the people. But it wasn't enough just to sacrifice the lamb. The people were also ordered by God to eat its flesh. So yes, the lamb was sacrificed. The blood was spread upon the doorposts of the people of Israel, of their homes. But that was not sufficient enough. They needed to consume the flesh of the lamb. Now, mind you, the lamb, of course, was not Jesus Christ. It was an animal. But we see the prefigurement there. How every Israelite family took a lamb without blemish, killed it at twilight, and put its blood on the doorposts of their houses. The Lord passed through the land of Egypt and struck dead the firstborn of Egypt. The Israelites were protected, and that is meant to be an image and a parallel for us, that when we are in a state of grace through the presence of the Eucharist, the enemy, the devil, and his minions cannot touch us. They cannot touch us. We can still be tempted, of course, but mind you, every temptation doesn't come from the devil. A lot of temptations come because of our fallen human nature. But when we are in a state of Eucharistic grace, the enemy cannot touch us in the extraordinary ways that he would wish to. So just as the Israelites were protected by the blood of the Paschal Lamb, of the Paschal Sacrifice, it is the same for us. Though in a very real and unique way. But to be protected, like I just said, it wasn't enough just for them to sacrifice the lamb. They needed to eat its flesh. You know, what do uh, so, many, so many soldiers and warriors after battle, what do, what do they do, especially after a victory? They feast. They celebrate that we survived and that we were victorious. And so that is what the Mass is also for us. It is a celebration of victory. Because who in the end has the ultimate victory? Jesus. And if that victory comes through his sacrifice upon the cross, a victory that we will all share in, God willing, we stay the course to the best of our ability by his grace in his second coming, where we will all experience a resurrection of the body, where our souls and our bodies will reunite and we will have new life in him in a glorified state. And the Mass is a preparation for that. Through protection, through his sanctity, through his guidance, we receive what it is that we need to continue to form ourselves in a way that's going to be prepared, a preparation for the resurrection of the body at the second coming. The original Passover happened only once but the Passover sacrifice was to be repeated perpetually. So what does that mean? It means that the original Passover, during the time of Moses, when the Israelites were actually in slavery in Egypt, it happened only once. But they are commanded by God to relive it. Not just remember it, but to relive it. Because that when, every year when the Jews celebrate Passover... 
It is not something that is merely symbolic for them. They are reliving it. Just as the Mass is not something merely symbolic for us, it is something that we are reliving. We are re-experiencing it. We are at Calvary. And so when they are living the Passover, where they're celebrating it, mind you, they are reliving it as if they themselves are actually there in Egypt all those centuries ago. So the day, so this day shall be to you a memorial, says the Lord, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Exodus chapter 12. So every year, at the same time, the Passover would be relived, not only remembered, but relived. And there is an example right there. This is a Jewish family celebrating the Seder meal or the Passover memorial. The unleavened bread that the Israelites, that Israel eats every year at Passover commemorates the haste of the departure that liberated them from Egypt. And so the yeast was not put into their bread because they were preparing, but they were preparing in haste. And so they ate unleavened bread. And what is one of the elements that we use in the Mass? It is unleavened bread. So we see another parallel about how the Israelites were preparing in haste for the coming of the Lord. We are preparing in haste for his return. So that is why we celebrate the Mass with unleavened bread. If we were to celebrate with something that you buy at Safeway, any type of leavened bread that you find there, the Mass would be invalid. So there would be no transubstantiation. There would be no Eucharistic presence. Only in unleavened bread can we confect the Eucharist because that is what is known as the proper element to be used. And the cup of blessing at the end of the Jewish Passover meal adds to the festive joy of wine an eschatological dimension, meaning that the, the, ex, the messianic expectation of the rebuilding of Jerusalem. And so what that means is the cup of blessing, eschatological meaning end of time, the messianic expectation of the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Now the temple in Jerusalem is still gone. And it was only in the temple that sacrifice could be offered. But miraculously, providentially, even after Rome, excuse me, after Israel was sacked and destroyed by the Romans, when the Roman Empire fell and Israel was being reestablished, so to speak, what did they try to do? They tried to rebuild the temple several times, but natural disasters kept bringing it down. Imagine that. Why? Because the old covenants have been fulfilled and the sacrifices of old are no longer necessary. But of course, because the Ark of the Covenant is also gone. So imagine that. Disasters are bringing down the attempts to rebuild the temple. And so it never happened, even after the Roman Empire fell. Every Jew... This day is still to celebrate the Passover as if God took him personally out of Egypt. So that is how it is celebrated. Again, it is not something that they only remember, but something that they relive as if they were actually there. The manna. Now when did the manna happen? What was, it, what was Israel doing during that time? Were they in Israel? No. They were wandering in the desert for how long? 40 years. That's right. And they eventually grumbled against God and Moses because they were often big whiners. You know, no pun intended with the wine that's used in the Mass. But they were given the manna that came down from heaven to sustain them. As our Lord himself declares that he is the living bread that comes down from heaven. Now, the manna was not Jesus. It was not the physical full presence of Jesus. It was miraculous bread that, of course, the Father had sent down from heaven, but it was not the Eucharist. It was not the divine presence of God himself that they would receive. The Israelites never experienced that in any of their covenants, but we do. And that is why the Mass is called, again, a Mass of Thanksgiving, a Thanksgiving to the Trinity 
that we have the grace and opportunity to receive something that everybody else in history, and still to this day, who are not part of our ranks, do not get to experience. So for all non-Catholics, they are more than welcome to attend Mass, to hear the word proclaimed to them, but they are not allowed to receive the Eucharist because they have not yet acknowledged that it is the full and living presence of God, body, blood, soul, and divinity. And they are also not yet willing to fully submit themselves to the teachings and the authority of the Catholic Church, something that we all do every time that we receive the Eucharist. I don't know if you knew that, but every time we receive the Eucharist, we are submitting ourselves to the authority of the Catholic Church and all of her teachings. And now, I think I've mentioned this statistic before that close to, I think even over 40% of our own people in our, in our own pews don't believe in the real presence. Even though they're baptized, fully confirmed, and have received full commun Holy Communion through the sacraments of initiation, still many of them do not believe in the real presence. They, they don't believe. And if we don't believe in the real presence, even as Catholics, should we be receiving? No. We should not. There's one priest in here who doubted the real presence. You know, there are stories about several priests who did and treated our Lord very badly. So there's one, which I find rather humorous, but also extremely serious. He was doubting the real presence of Christ. And as he's elevating the chalice in Mass before a crucifix that's on the wall right in front of him, you know what happens? The right hand of Jesus from the corpus on the, cru on the crucifix detaches and takes the chalice from him. Saying, you're my priest, why are you doubting me? And only after repenting of his doubt was the chalice restored to him. And then the crucifix returned to its place upon the cross. So yes, sometimes even priests have doubts in their hearts, but our Lord is saying, do not doubt. This is really me. And I am longing for you, and I want you to long for me. Because during the Exodus, there was a longing. There was a hunger, right? The people were hungering. They weren't hungering for God. They were hungering for physical satisfaction. But the Mass is meant to be an expression also of longing for us, to show that we are longing for our Lord in his word as well as sacrament. And during the Exodus, God provided for the Israelites in the desert, sending them bread from heaven, the manna. Now, manna would be one of the three elements, that would, the three items, mind you, that ended up in the Ark of the Covenant. Can anybody tell me one of the other three that were there? Joe? The staff of Aaron, that's right. And Aaron was the first high priest Aaron, the older brother of Moses, the first high priest of the Old Covenant, excellent, which miraculously bloomed to show that his priesthood was authentic and that he had the actual authority given to him by God. Now, what was the, we have the manna and we have the staff of Aaron. What was the third item? The Decalogue, the tablets of the Ten Commandments. That's right, excellent. Now, the remembrance of the manna will always recall to Israel what it, that it lives by the bread of the word of God. Remember our Lord says to the devil when he's tempted, it is not sufficient that one should live on bread alone, but by every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, this is Moses talking to the people, and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. And here it is again, the sanctuary. Right up there, we see the Ark of the Covenant that would be behind the veil. And the high priest is not entering past the veil because in this image, it's obviously not the Day of Atonement. It's not Yom Kippur. So instead, he's standing before the altar of incense, which was right in front of the veil where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. And so he's offering incense on behalf of the people of Israel. And as we heard last time from the book of Revelation, when John sees an angel carrying a thurible of incense, the angel tells John what? That the smoke that's rising symbolizes the intentions or the prayers of the people rising to heaven. 
You know, many of the thuribles are often in the shape of a little church. Some of them look, a lot of them look like they're, they're balls, medieval balls. But the traditional way that they were designed was in the design of a little church where you would see little staples on the bottom of the thurible that was on the stand. And that symbolized the prayers of the people being raised up whenever incense was being offered, when it was being burned. So hopefully we'll be able to use incense just a little bit more in the future here at our parish because it's something that I particularly love to use just as an expression of what it is that's taking place, of course. Now the Israelites, unlike us, had no direct access to God's presence in the Holy of Holies. Only the high priest could go in there one time a year. And where are we now? Where's the new Ark of the Covenant? Right there. An image of our Blessed Mother, the living Ark of the Covenant. So it's right there. We all have access to it now. Because the Old Covenant has been fulfilled. The veil of the temple was torn in two, as the Gospel relates to us, when Jesus expired on the cross. That veil is no longer there. We all have access to him. Direct access, something that the Israelites of old did not have. It was restricted only to the high priest once a year. And in the holy place, so right outside the Holy of Holies, what was there? The shoe bread that could only be consumed by the priests. Now the shoe bread, again, it was not the Eucharist, but a prefigurement of the Eucharist. So the eating of that bread, they were not consuming the full presence of the divine. It was an offering to him. It was an expression, a symbol of his presence, right, in the Holy of Holies. So the shoe bread was not God, but another prefigurement of the coming of the new and eternal covenant. The Todah offering. This is something that we haven't talked about. For from the book of Malachi, we have... From the rising of the sun to its setting, my name is great among the nations. And in every place, incense is offered to my name, and a pure offering for my name is great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. So this is a prophecy of Malachi, seeing that in the future, there will be many places that are offering burnt incense in honor to God, for his name is indeed great. But at the time of the Davidic kingdom, which we're seeing here, we're seeing the first temple period during the time of King David, before King Nebuchadnezzar and the, Babylon and the Babylonians over 400 years later come and destroy the first temple, we see the temple of the Davidic kingdom. And the thanks offering of unleavened bread and wine became the primary liturgy celebrated in the temple in gratitude for God's deliverance. The book of Leviticus chapter 7 tells us this as well as Psalm number 50. So the main sacrifices, the primary sacrifices that were being offered were not the animal sacrifices on the brazen altar that we see outside of the holy place doors, but rather it is the sacrifice, the offering, mind you, of bread and wine as their primary liturgy, their expression of thanksgiving to God for deliverance from where? Their slavery in Egypt, deliverance from their enemies. As we are thanking God here in the sacrifice of the Mass for deliverance from whom? Satan, our enemy. Thanking him for deliverance from our slavery, not in Egypt, but to sin. Even though we still sin, we are striving for sanctification. We are striving for total communion and liberation with our Lord as we approach him in the Eucharistic sacrifice. Now the Midrash... It tells us, in the Messianic age, all sacrifices will cease except for the thank offering. The Midrash are Jewish writings. So even in these Jewish writings, we are being told by the prophecy that these ancient rabbis were experiencing that in the Messianic age, all other sacrifices will cease except for the thanks offering. The thanks offering of the bread and the wine. All other sacrifices have ceased. There are no more animal sacrifices because the temple is no longer there. They are not necessary anymore. 
The ultimate sacrifice has come. It has happened upon the cross. Jesus, the Lamb of God, who has laid down his life for us. And so that is the only sacrifice, the thanksgiving offering of bread and wine upon Calvary that is still necessary for being offered, that we relive, that we re-experience. So why don't we take, uh, ten, why don't we take 10 minutes, move, move about, stretch, use the facilities, and we'll come back at 11 to, uh, fin- to finish for the second half, okay? We'll talk a little bit about the uh, Shabbat and the Kiddush. Now these are particular forms of prayer that, were, that are offered on, and that continue to be offered for Jewish feasts and celebrations. They were the blessings over the bread and the wine for the Sabbath, the day of rest, a pre, another prefiguration for the Eucharist. And so again, those are called Shabbat and Kiddush, specific prayers for Jewish festivals and celebrations when there are prayers and blessings over bread and wine. And now in the fullness of time, as we all know, Jesus appears and begins to preach the kingdom of God. So the long-awaited Messiah has come, the one who will fulfill all of the old covenants, who will fulfill all of the prophecies given to us by the prophets, has come. And so we see in his life, in his coming, the first prefiguration of the Eucharist will be at the wedding feast of Cana where our Lord's time had not yet come, but because of his mother's insistence, and he denies her nothing, he performs the miracle at the wedding feast of Cana. Now, thanks be to God, this doesn't happen anymore, especially for us men, but in the time of first century Israel, wedding celebrations would last a week. (laughs) They would last a week. How fathers didn't go broke, I have no idea. (laughs) But if the wine ran out, during those seven days, it was considered a very, very great shame. And there was disgrace that was brought upon the family. So this was no small matter, especially for the groom and the bride. And we do not know their names. We don't know who they are, but we know that our Lord and our Lady were there. And they interceded. So we see also not just a prefiguration of the Eucharist in the wedding feast of Cana, but how vital our relationship with our Blessed Mother is because she is called the Mediatrix. She is the new and living Ark of the Covenant who bore the presence of the divine the same way the Ark of the Covenant did, but though in a very different and very unique, real way, fully, she receives the presence of the divine in her womb as we receive him into our bodies through the Holy Eucharist. She, again, is the Mediatrix. What does that mean? It means that every blessing from God that comes to us first goes through her to us, in all of our intentions that we offer back to God, even though we're not acknowledging Our Lady, particularly in every single intention maybe, all of the intentions that we offer to God return to Him through her. And so that's why we need to have a close relationship with her because she is the one who intercedes for us more than anyone to the Holy Trinity. Now the sign of the water turned into wine at Cana announces the hour of Jesus' glorification. So there are four elements that are required for a valid Mass. That is the unleavened bread, the wine, the priest, and the water. Because what is the wine mixed with? With water. It is commingled with water. What do we pray when they are mingled? Through the mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share in the, in the divinity of Christ who humbled himself to share in our humanity. It's a very beautiful prayer. So We are showing that we are preparing to unite with our Lord in the fullness of his divinity as he humbled himself to share in our humanity. Because Jesus is what is, is, what is called the hypostatic union. The hypostatic union is the living of two full natures in one being because he is fully God as well as fully man, the hypostatic union, where those two natures are in harmony and not in opposition with one another. In the wedding feast of Cana, it makes manifest the fulfillment of the wedding feast in the Father's kingdom, where the faithful will drink the new wine that has become the blood of Christ. And where do we see that again? In the book of Revelation 
where in the heavenly Jerusalem, in the heavenly kingdom, where the sacrifice, the wedding banquet in chapter 19 of the book of Revelation is made manifest. So the wedding feast of the Lamb is the Mass, which is why I mentioned last time. You know, we see pictures of the Mass in the 1950s where women are dressed in their absolute best, men are all in suits and ties. Why? Even if it's just a typical Sunday Mass, it's because they are coming to the wedding feast of the Lamb. So they are dressing in their best, prepared to give their best in offering back to God their thanksgiving and praise for what it is that they have received. Is that something that all of us should be doing? Coming dressed in our best, acknowledging that we are about to enter into a wedding feast. The Mass is so many things, my brothers and sisters. The wedding feast of the Lamb, the Paschal sacrifice, an offering of thanksgiving, an offering of atonement. It's so many things. But such an outward expression of our love and our gratitude for our Lord is such a beautiful thing. Something that I think that we really need to return to in that spirit of understanding. Because we see when we're celebrating the, the sacrament of marriage, everybody's in their best. They're all decked out. And should that not be the same for every Sunday Mass that we attend? Now, daily Mass is something that's a little bit different because people are going to work and all kinds of things like that that they have going on, which is totally understandable. I'm just saying we should, as your spiritual father, I should be encouraging all of us, including myself, to put our best foot forward in every way, physically, mentally, spiritually, as we prepare ourselves to receive the Eucharist in the Mass on Sunday. St. Francis de Sales would often say that everything that he did would be in preparation for the next time that he would receive the Holy Eucharist. Everything that he did, he had entered into that place because of the sanctity he had reached. Every single thing that he did throughout the day, it was meant to be a preparation for him for the next time he would receive the Holy Eucharist. What a beautiful thing for us to contemplate as we move towards our consecration. And then, of course, we have the multiplication of the loaves. The miracles of the multiplication of the loaves, when the Lord says the blessings breaks, the bread is broken in the mass, he breaks the bread and distributes the loaves through the works of his disciples. So he's the one who performs the miracle, and then it's through his disciples that that miracle is distributed. And as a priest, as, as, a, as a disciple myself, in union with the successor of the apostles, the bishops, that miracle that is worked in the Holy Mass is distributed through me to all of you, right? And so we see the prefigurement there. Through the disciples, the multitude are fed, and this prefigures the superabundance of this unique bread and his Holy Eucharistic presence. Now here we go, here we go with John chapter 6. Now, what does our Lord say in John chapter 6? Verse 30, John chapter 6, verse 32. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. My Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I say to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and him who comes to me I will not cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up at the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. And then we come to verse 43, where Jesus answered all of the Jews who were murmuring against him at his words, Do not murmur among you, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. 
It is written in the prophets. He's breaking open the scriptures for us about how it is revealed in the prophets. And they shall all be taught by God, says the prophets. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone who has seen the Father except him who is from God, he has seen the Father. Truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that a man may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not such as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. The first announcement of the Eucharist divided by the disciples. And from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. So after he had proclaimed this, that he is the living bread come down from heaven, and unless you wish to have no part of him, you must eat his flesh and drink his blood. If he was speaking symbolically, why would so many have left him? It's because he did not speak symbolically, but literally. Remember that the English language did not exist in the time of Christ. The Bible was not originally written in English. Jesus spoke Aramaic. His words were translated into Greek and Hebrew, the original text of the Scriptures. So let's see what type of words he really used, shall we? In John chapter 6, prior to verse 54, where our Lord says, He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. Prior to that, the word, the Greek word ethio is the word used for eating, whereas Christ uses the, word, the Greek word trogo, there onwards. Estio is used for normal human eating, while trogo is a more physical word describing the process of munching or crunching. This shifts by Christ to a less common word which emphasizes the physicality of eating serves as one of the definitive proofs for our Lord's expression of transubstantiation. So our Lord is not using symbolic terms here. The Greek words that he is using mean physical, literal, So we see that right there in the scriptures. Something that our Protestant brothers and sisters have either forgotten or have not yet heard. So that is why we are called to make this known. For within John chapter 6, estio is used in verses 5, 23, 26, 31, 49, 50, 51, 53, and 58. While trogo is used in verse 54, 56, 57, and 58. All that you have just heard from me now, where our Lord is using physical, literal terminology to express how he is literally giving us his presence, and it's something that literally must be done. There are a couple of more proofs, but we'll get into that later on. We have time. But you just see right there in that one example alone that this truly is him. Do not doubt, but believe. For he who eats 
his flesh and drinks his blood with faith and lives that Eucharistic faith will be raised up on the last day and have life eternal. So unlike those who heard these words and walked away, we do not walk away. For even if you had such a horrible priest, one that was absolutely despicable, had all kinds of sinful problems and habits, if the Mass is offered validly, Jesus is still there. That is why we are here, not for the priest, not for the joy of the fellowship and community, those, those are all beautiful things, we are here for him. So no matter what happens, with that in mind, no matter what the Holy Father is saying or doing or not doing, how could we ever leave the Catholic Church when this is what we have, when this is who we have in the Eucharist? How could we leave? How could we ever abandon such a thing? It's incomprehensible to me. Because to receive in faith the gift of his Eucharist is to receive the Lord himself. Now mind you, yes, it is only Jesus who is sacramentally present, but the three divine persons of the Trinity cannot divide themselves. If so, that would be to say that there is more than one God, which we of course know there isn't. So in the Eucharist, even though it's only Jesus who is sacramentally present, we receive the fullness of God. We receive also the Father and the Holy Spirit fully. The God, the creator that the entire cosmos and all of time, space, and history cannot contain. We receive in this divine gift. So how could we not want to prepare ourselves mentally, physically, spiritually, in every way possible to receive this gift. First, that we receive at the Last Supper. Well, the Last Supper wasn't only the first Mass, it was also what? What else took place at the Last Supper? Anybody remember? No, not, Pente not Pentecost. That comes, that comes days later. What about the priest? Yes, there's that word, ordained. That's right. So the ordination of the first bishops, the first priests of the church, is also what took place in the Last Supper. The Mass is being instituted, and the ones who will be authorized to offer the Mass to confect the miracle are the priests, descended through St. Peter and the other apostles. At the Last Supper, Jesus washed their feet and gave them the commandment of love. Now why does he wash their feet? Well, we remember how the priest, before entering the holy place in the tabernacle, during the time of the old covenants, would wash his face in the laver, wash his face, his hands, and his body, purifying himself as he prepares to enter the holy place. This is a purification ritual that Jesus is doing. He goes down to the lowest part of the human person and washes his feet, saying, I am washing away your filth, and now I am longing for you to walk in my ways. That is what he is saying. You are my priests. You are my first disciples. I wash you clean so that you may be prepared to walk in my ways and offer the sacrifice of the Mass serving as a reminder to them what he has told them. If the world hates you, as you live in my person, in persona Christi Capitis, in the person of Christ the head, it will hate you too. If the world has hated me, as it has, it will hate you too. That is why it is not easy being a disciple, because the world hates us, because we are against everything that the world is about which goes to show that the church, our religion, our faith, is not man-made because the world would love its own, right? And why does the world hate us? Because we are not of this world. We are pilgrims, only here for a time. We don't know how long. 
Not all of us live to a ripe old age. We don't know how long we're here. That's why we always need to be prepared. Because we are on a pilgrimage throughout this world. This world is not our home. Our time here is only a speck compared to eternity. And it is the Mass again, the Eucharist, that is preparing us for entrance to the place of eternity that our merits and union with Christ will inherit, whether that's salvation or damnation. Many of us will go through purification first in purgatory, but all the souls in purgatory will eventually go to heaven. So that is something that we are preparing ourselves for. There's that word, preparation. We find that all throughout the scriptures and we find it all throughout our liturgical year. We are preparing for Holy Week. We are preparing for Easter. We are preparing to receive the Eucharist. We are preparing to enter salvation when our earthly pilgrimage is done. It's all about preparation. That should be something significant that the Eucharist reminds us of. For Jesus instituted the Eucharist as a memorial of his death and resurrection and commanded his apostles to celebrate it until his return. So take take heed of that word, commanded. He didn't suggest it, saying, you know, do this only sometimes whenever you feel like it. He said, do this always in remembrance of me. Because like baptism, the Eucharist is not something suggested for salvation. It is required. What does he say? Jesus doesn't say, you know, come to Mass on Sunday, and then I will raise you up on the last day. He says, eat my flesh and drink my blood so that you have life within you. That seed of eternal life that we are all longing for in heaven is being received right here and now to again prepare us for that in its totality. So thereby, he constituted them priests of the New Testament, of the New Covenant. The Levitical priesthood, Levitical from the tribe of Levi, whose name's right up there on the other side, the the third-born son of Jacob. The Levitical priesthood is about to be fulfilled upon our Lord's expiration on the cross. And the priesthood of the New and Eternal Covenant is now established. Of course, at the Mass, the the Last Supper, the main event is the institution of the Eucharist. Because while celebrating the Passover, now mind you, the Mass was the Passover feast. They're celebrating Passover. All of the Jews who were on their pilgrimage to Jerusalem, the holy city, they were all coming there to celebrate the Passover, to remember and re-celebrate, relive the Passover. And so that is our inheritance. The Mass is the inheritance of the Passover. Because while celebrating the Passover, Jesus instituted the Eucharist, giving the Jewish Passover its definitive meaning. So our Lord isn't changing anything. He says he hasn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. So he is fulfilling the Passover. Everything that the Passover was about before his coming the offering of the paschal lamb, the eating of the lamb's the eating of the lamb's flesh, the unleavened bread, that was all preparation for the consummation and the fulfillment of the passover at the mass. So no the passover hasn't changed, it has been fulfilled. So you'll say well there are different prayers, there are different uh, there, there are different uh, expressions of worship, so on and so forth, yes. But the essence of it the central meaning of it it all, deliverance from our enemy has not changed. Receiving new life and receiving atonement for sins, that has all not changed. And Jesus is passing over to his Father by his death and resurrection, the new Passover, because what is Jesus passing over from? He is passing over from this world back to his Father. That's why it is called the new Passover. Right? So Jesus, the new Moses, who first at his baptism 
as the Israelites of old passed through the Jordan, where Jesus was baptized into the promised land, Jesus, the new Moses, who is baptized in that very same river, and then goes out into the desert to be tempted for 40 days, as Israel was being purified of their sin of, the, of idolatry for 40 years, we see the parallels there. Jesus passes through the same waters as the new Moses to come and lead us out of slavery again, not in Egypt, but of sin. And in that action is anticipated in the supper and celebrated in the Eucharist, which fulfills again, not changes, but fulfills the Jewish Passover and anticipates the final Passover of the church in the glory of the kingdom. When Christ returns, when there are new heavens and a new earth and all has been totally fulfilled. And now we come to a very, very significant moment. Now Jesus is the new everyone. He's the new Adam, the new Noah, the new Moses, the new Abraham, the new King David. He's all of them, rolled into one. But in the first covenant, with whom? Adam. Good job, everyone. <laughs> yes, the first covenant with Adam. Where does the bride of Adam come from? From his side, from his rib, where God removes a rib from Adam, covers, covers it with flesh, and forms Eve, his bride, bone of his bone and flesh of his, fret, his flesh. And where does the bride of the new Adam come from? Good question. It comes from his side as well. When his heart is pierced and outflows blood and water, signifying what? The two essential sacraments for salvation, the blood symbolizing the Eucharist and the water for baptism. So from both Adams, from their sides comes their bride. Coincidence? Absolutely not. Because it's said that on Golgotha is where Adam was buried. So Jesus, according, Jesus, according to tradition, is said to have died in the same place where Adam, the first Adam, after 931 years of life, wow, died. For it was upon a tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that sin and death entered the world. And it was on a tree, the wood of the cross, that life and renewal of paradise was returned to us. All upon the wood of a tree. And there it is. The baptism and the Eucharist right from the heart of our Lord. For there were two births of the church. The sacramental birth which took place when his sacred heart was pierced and outflowed blood and water, and then the communal birth of the church, which happened when? Anybody know? When did the communal, the communal birth of the church take place? Passover. Excuse me, Pentecost. Not Passover, Pentecost. You seen if you're paying attention. So at Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit descended in the form of tongues of fire, sanctified and sealed the apostles and all who were in the upper room to go out and proclaim the gospel. And they did so no longer in fear, because upon the Holy Spirit's coming, they were no longer afraid. And they went out and proclaimed the gospel and continued to offer the sacrifice of the Mass as commanded. Do this in memory of me, our Lord says, and that is exactly what they do. For the Eucharist is the memorial of Christ's Passover, of the work of salvation accomplished by his life, death, and resurrection, the Paschal mystery. It was above all on the first day of the week, the Sabbath day, Sunday, the day of Jesus' resurrection that the Christians met to break bread. And at every celebration of the Eucharist, the people of God advanced toward the heavenly banquet when all the elect will be seated at the table of the kingdom. See, there are a lot of people who are striving in this life to have their names you know, written on monuments, written on plaques, written in halls of fame, whatever it is. But all of that means absolutely nothing if our names are not written in the book of life. That is the only place we should be striving to have our names. Even if nobody knows who we are in this life, we become unknown saints. 
which is the way to go. As long as our names are written in the book of life, that is what matters. Now, the sacramental sacrifice. We'll t we talked a little bit in the beginning about how the Mass is, is all thanksgiving, memorial, and presence, all rolled into one. When we celebrate the memorial of the Lord's sacrifice, we offer to the Father what He has Himself given to us. We remember from the Mass the first prayer that the priest offers after the penitential rite, after we, all of you, not me, all of you have been absolved from your venial sins. Anybody remember the first prayer of the Mass when I say, Lord, when I say, let us pray? Anybody remember what that prayer is called? It begins with a C. The collect prayer. It's spelled collect, but it's pronounced collect. So the collect prayer is addressed specifically to the Father as the Mass in its totality is directed to the Father. So we are giving thanks and acknowledging our Father for everything that He has given to us, especially the gift of His own beloved Son, whom He did not spare for our sake. We offer Him back the gifts of His creation, the bread and the wine, which will eventually become the body and blood of His Son. Because the Eucharist is therefore summed up right here, thanksgiving and praise to the Father, the sacrificial memorial of Christ in His body, the presence of Christ by the power of his word and of his spirit. That is what we participate in. All of you were here last weekend for Mass, I trust, and you saw the video just, before, just uh, before the homily, I take it. Is anybody particularly moved by that? I hope so. Because that's just a small, small image of what's taking place at every single Mass whether it's being done in someone's home or in St. Peter's in Rome. Every single Mass, the angels, the saints, the Trinity, Our Lady, the souls in purgatory, all of them are there. That is what we participate in. And if we could see all of that, unless given a special grace by our Lord, as some visionaries have been, we couldn't handle it. You know, just as Moses, who was dwelled in the presence of God more fully than anybody else during the time of the Old Covenant, most likely, he still could not look upon his face lest he die, right? If we saw all of that, you think we could take it without a special grace? No, we would, we would all die of awe. So the thanksgiving and praise to the Father is what take place in the Mass. That the Eucharist is a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving for the work of the Father in all of creation. A sacrifice of thanksgiving you know, I'm repeating this word, thanksgiving, so that we remember that, so that we have it all ingrained in our subcraniums. Because thanksgiving, no, not turkey and stuffing and all that. Thanksgiving is something that should be echoing in our minds as we come to Mass. What am I thankful for? What am I going to offer back to God and thanks for his blessings to express my love and my gratitude for him? Am I telling him that I love him? Am I expressing my gratitude or am I just offering a litany of requests to be fulfilled? So that's something that we should be echoing in our minds, especially as we prepare for our Eucharistic consecration. Am I thankful? Am I giving thanks? Because the more we grow in a spirit of, joy, of gratitude, the more we grow in a spirit of joy. Because the Mass is also a sacrifice of praise by which the church sings glory to God in the name of creation. I was just on retreat in something that I really enjoy doing. I enjoy singing and chanting the entirety of the Mass. So being alone up in the little chapel that I was at, I was able to chant the entire Mass because it's not only something that I enjoy doing, but it's something that I think offers more worthy praise to our Lord because St. Augustine said that he who sings twice, he who sings prays twice. And, and that is what we're doing in the Mass. It is a sacrifice of praise as well as thanksgiving offered through Jesus and with him to be accepted in him. It is the one sacrifice acceptable to the Father. And it is the memorial of Christ's Passover, of his Passover from this life back to his heavenly Father. While first descending into Sheol, the place of waiting, 
to retrieve all of the souls of the righteous waiting for the coming of the Messiah to reopen paradise for them in the kingdom of heaven. So in the Mass, the making present of the sacrificial offering is the unique sacrifice in the liturgy of the church. Because in the Eucharist, the work of our redemption is continually carried out. It's not a new sacrifice. It is the sacrifice that is continuous, as it is continuously carried out and relived and experienced by us because it is the memorial of Christ's Passover, again, and the Eucharist is also the sacrifice which represents, remember I said that hyphen there is essential, not represents, but represents, makes present for us, in other words, the sacrifice of the cross, brings us to Calvary. It is the participation in the Paschal Mystery. Christian liturgy not only recalls the events that saved us, but it actualizes them. It makes them present, right? So we're not only remembering what happened 2,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, we are there. We are experiencing it for ourselves. When we celebrate the Mass, then, it means we are at the foot of the cross. Christ's work of salvation becomes present and real. And the sacrifice of the Eucharist, the sacrifice of Christ on the cross are one and the same. They are one single sacrifice. Yes, the Last Supper and the Crucifixion were two separate events, but it is the Mass that brings them together. It is the sacrifice of the Church, the body of Christ, all of us, which participates in the offering of her head. We receive the body of Christ because we are the body of Christ. It is Jesus Christ who is our head, and we, like our physical bodies, are many members. We are one body. You know, the ear can't do what the nose can do and vice versa. Just as all of you can't do what I can do as a priest, but all of you have your unique and very essential roles in the working of the church as the body of Christ. And to be strengthened and nourished as the body of Christ, we need to receive the fullness of his presence. The whole church is united with the offering and intercession of Christ for the pope, the bishop, the priest, the deacons, all of the community. That is why the word Catholic in Greek, katholikos, means universal. We are all united. So somewhere in the world right now, a mass is being offered, or many are being offered, and all of us are there with them. We are celebrating in union together constantly. And to the offering of Christ are united not only the members still here on earth, but also those already in the glory of heaven. I mentioned that there are three levels of the church. Who can tell me the first level? What are those first, first level members called? Joe? Uh, the church militant is us here, here on earth, yes. But uh, those who are already glorified in heaven are called the what? The church triumphant, right. Those who have fought the good fight as the church militant and have achieved victory with Christ by entering into paradise with him. And then there are whom? So we got the church uh, triumphant, we got the church militant, all of us here on earth fighting the good fight, and then the church what? The church suffering, which are whom? The souls in purgatory. So the church triumphant, the church militant, and the church suffering, those in purgatory. All of them are united with us. The souls in purgatory who are here with us, as well as the souls of the church triumphant in heaven are here with us. And it is the souls in purgatory who pray for us, but they cannot pray for themselves. So that is why they need our intercession. And that is why an intercession is offered for them in every single mass where we pray for the dead, that the infinite power of the mass may aid them in their purification and that they may enter paradise quickly. And that is why we offer the funeral mass for the soul of the faithful departed. That any sin that may have clung to them may be forgiven and washed away so that they may enter paradise immediately, God willing, and no longer, and, and see no time in purgatory. Because the Eucharistic sacrifice is also offered for the faithful departed who have died in Christ that are not yet wholly purified. There it is, the catechism acknowledges it. 
And for anybody who may not have heard before the CCC right there, that's Catechism of the Catholic Church in the paragraph which it is found. So the Catechism itself is acknowledging that the Mass is something where, is a place where we pray for those who are still being purified. For thus says the Lord in the book of Revelation that nothing impure will enter my presence. Because God is all pure. And so th that is why we are called for purification and sanctification in this life as the white garment we receive at our baptism reminds us. So the Mass, appropriatory sacrifice. Was Christ's sacrifice not sufficient at the cross? Many Protestants will ask that question. Is Jesus re-sacrificed again and again? But what does the letter to the Hebrews say? But now he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. And where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. So why is the Mass essential then for the reliving of the sacrifice of Christ. The Messiah's sacrifice is final and complete, yes, but the Eucharist represents the sacrifice of the cross perpetually. So it is not a new sacrifice that we're being offered. It's not different. It is one in the same that is being offered, that is being celebrated perpetually in a non-bloody way. Jesus' sacrifice is outside of time. He is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, as 1 Peter and Revelation remind us. In his vision of eternity, John saw a lamb as though it had been slain. So John sees the Paschal lamb. The Mass actualizes Calvary's sacrifice to our very lives. We enter the throne room and come to the cross and plead for the sanctification that Christ's blood gives to us. We saw in John chapter 6 the literal words that Jesus used showing that this is not a symbol. This is literally my presence, the real presence. Christ is present in many ways to his church, but he is present most especially in the Eucharist. He's present through the priest. He's present through the other sacraments. He's present through creation. He's present through interactions we have with our brothers and sisters. He's present in so many ways, but nowhere else is he more present than in the Eucharistic sacrifice. In the Eucharist, the body and the blood, soul and divinity of Christ, and therefore the whole Christ is truly, really, and substantially contained. Why we are called to guard, reverence, and honor that reality not only at the Mass, but whenever we're in the church, conducting ourselves in a prayerful and reverent way. Should we need to have conversations that may seem longer, we should take them into the vestibule. We should take them outside, continuing to maintain a spirit of prayer and reverence in God's holy temple. The church fathers. It was the church fathers again many disciples of the apostles that Scott Hahn was studying and he found in their writings and in their works words like liturgy, sacrament, all kinds of things like that. Long before any type of Pentecostalism or Lutheranism or any type of Protestant denomination came about, that only happened in the 16th century. This is back in the first century where the church fathers such as St. Ignatius of Antioch Reveal. And what does he say? In AD 110, I desire the bread of God, which is the flesh of Jesus Christ, who was of the seed of David. And for drink, I desire his blood, which is love incorruptible. His letter to the Romans. Not the letter to the Romans in the New Testament, but Ignatius of Antioch's letter to his Roman community. I won't read that entire quote for you, but we see the fact that we as the Catholic Church are the original church that has existed since Christ himself in the time of the apostles. Now I believe that, I, be, I might be wrong about this, but I believe, I'm almost certain, not positive, but almost certain that Ignatius of Antioch was a disciple of the apostle John. 
before he, before he died. Justin Martyr. Works for, words from him as well. So if you want to find these quotes, just simply look up these names and see how these church fathers acknowledge that the Mass has always existed since the time of Christ. Cl- including Irenaeus of Loins. He has declared the cup a part of creation to be his own blood from which he causes our blood to flow and the bread a part of creation he has established as his own body from which he gives increase unto our bodies. Because there were many heresies that were speaking against the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist even early on in the earliest days of the church where people were saying, no, this is something only symbolic. The church fathers are speaking out against these heresies, these falsehoods, and saying, no, this is the real presence. This is God that he calls us to do in remembrance of him. And it is transubstantiation that makes that possible. The catechism tells us, by the consecration of the bread and the wine, there takes place a change of the whole substance of the bread into the substance of the body of Christ our Lord and of the whole substance of the wine into the substance of his blood. So we think of it like this. When our bodies are sick, there's something going on inside that we can't see happening, but yet we know it's happening. When we are given medicine and we we become well again, which is a process, again, we don't see it physically taking place, but yet we know that it's happening. Similar to the transubstantiation, Though it still appears to be bread and wine according to the senses, we know because Christ himself has revealed it to us and our faith makes it known to us. We acknowledge that transubstantiation has happened and it is now the fullness of the living God. Only validity, only validly ordained priests can preside at the Eucharist and consecrate the bread and the wine so that they become the body and the blood of our Lord. So if a Protestant pastor came to celebrate the Mass with us, could they be in the sanctuary with us? No. They are not priests. They are not ordained. So that is not to shun them. That is not to condemn them. But that is to acknowledge that there is something far greater taking place here than what they have likely experienced or not experienced before. And so we talked about last time, who's the new Ark of the Covenant? Mary. Mary is the new Ark of the Covenant. As we said before, in the covenant of old, it contained those three items, the tablets of the commandments, the manna that came down from heaven, and the rod of Aaron, symbolizing his priesthood. The book of Revelation acknowledges there in the temple of God, was opened in heaven, and the Ark of His Covenant was seen in His temple. This is all being seen by the Apostle John in the heavenly kingdom. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then, being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. Our Lady, the Blessed Virgin Mary, carried in her womb Jesus, the eternal Word of God, the bread of life, and the great High Priest. As the Ark of the Covenant of old carried the divine presence in a symbolic way, she now carries the divine presence literally, as we do, when we receive his Eucharistic presence, as he continues to be present among us in the Blessed Sacrament. Because the Mass is a place where we worship, where we assemble together to offer sacrifice in praise and in worship of the triune God. We express our faith in the real presence of Christ here in the Eucharist by genuflecting or bowing deeply as a sign of adoration for our Lord. In his Eucharistic presence, Jesus remains mysteriously in our midst as the one who loved us and gave himself up for us. The real presence cannot be apprehended by the senses, but only by faith, which relies on divine authority. Because faith is a gift It is a blessing, and that is why we're called to pray for the strengthening of our own faith, but that the gift of faith may also be received by others who have not yet acknowledged it. Because it is the Mass also that is the Paschal Banquet, 
what is the Paschal mystery, the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's in this sacred banquet that we are in communion with our Lord's body and blood. And to receive communion is to receive himself who has offered himself for us. He is the one whom we are receiving, not something symbolic. Because the altar is both the altar of sacrifice and the table of the Lord. The priest reverences the altar twice because it is the symbol of the cross. Because Christ is both victim offered for our reconciliation and is food from heaven who is giving himself to us. So Christ is the one who is offering the sacrifice and he also is the sacrifice. The sign of communion is more complete under both species, under the form of the Eucharist and the precious blood. But communion under the species of bread alone is enough to receive the full fruit of Eucharistic grace where we can receive God's life. We offer our lives in the Mass as a sacrifice and receive His in exchange. Our sacrifice is united to His from Colossians chapter 1. So again, we are offering ourselves in sacrifice with Christ as we receive His in that marital bond, that marital covenant that we have with Him. And that covenant again is sealed when the two become one flesh. And we become one flesh with Him as we receive the Eucharist, into our bodies. We enter the Holy of Holies. It is the union between bridegroom and bride. We all have access now to the Holy of Holies, for the veil again has been torn in two. There is an exchange between the human and the divine, wherein we are made partakers of the divine nature. We give thanks to God who humbled himself to share in our human nature and who gives himself to us to be united with him in his divine nature. For in the Garden of Eden, we shared in the, divine, in the image of the divine nature in a very real and very full and different way. And so that is the nature that we are striving to achieve again in this life. By turning away from sin and receiving that sanctification by the presence of Christ more and more so that we can be in that state before the fall that we were and thus again be permitted to enter paradise which we had lost and were cast out of. Because Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, where he invites us to come to the feast, to respond to this invitation. Again, we must prepare ourselves for so great and so holy a moment which is why we fast one hour before receiving communion. So that the temple, our bodies is cleansed, our souls are cleansed of any mortal sin, and we are prepared and in a state of grace to receive him. For anyone who is conscious of grave sin must receive the sacrament of reconciliation before coming to communion. And confessions here are about to get started in five minutes, so you'll have the perfect opportunity to do that should you need. Because it is true That even though we are in a state of grace, we are not worthy that the Lord should enter under our roofs, but we ask him to only say the word and we shall be healed. The church obliges the faithful to attend Mass on Sundays and feast days and to receive the Eucharist at least once a year. Receiving only once a year, I I couldn't do that. But the, the church strongly encourages then that we receive the Holy Eucharist every Sunday and feast day or even daily. Because when we choose to not come to Sunday Mass, we commit a mortal sin. Where we don't keep the Sabbath day holy, which is which commandment? The third, thou shalt keep the Sabbath day holy. And how do we keep it holy? By not doing any unnecessary labor and by coming to Mass. So if we're only coming to Mass once a year without good reason... We are committing mortal sin and thus need to go to confession before going to the Eucharist again. Because here is a story of sacrilege in the time of the Old Covenant in the book of, from the book of Numbers. Now Korah rose up before Moses with some of the children of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation. They gathered together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, you take too much upon yourselves for all the congregation is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? And the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up. 
with their households and all of the men with Korah. And a fire came out from the Lord and consumed the 250 men as they spoke blasphemy, saying that everybody is holy and that the Lord is among them. That was blasphemy because we're not holy. We need to strive for holiness. And so that is why that took place. Therefore, whoever eats this bread, eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So in chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians, St. Paul is warning us, he is reminding us that if we are receiving in a state of mortal sin, if we are receiving in an unprepared way, not acknowledging his full presence, his true presence, we are eating and drinking condemnation upon ourselves. And that is not to deprive us of our Lord's Eucharistic presence by becoming scrupulous, but to remind us that if we are in a state of serious sin, we must go to confession before coming to receive him so that we can receive the fruits of Holy Communion, which brings us union with Christ, separates us from sin, and wipes away our venial sins, preserves us from future mortal sins, and strengthens the unity of the mystical body by a deeper incorporation into the church, commits us to the poor, whom we are called to serve through almsgiving and spiritual intercession. Overall, the Eucharist is meant to bring about the unity of Christians through a bond of charity. So the Protestants and all of those not yet gathered into the fold are outside of the covenant. They separated themselves, but now we are praying and working to bring them back because we see and acknowledge again that the Mass transcends space and time. We are both in heaven and at the foot of the cross. The Eucharist is the anticipation of heavenly glory. It is the intercession between heaven and earth, time and eternity. And with all the warriors of the heavenly army, we sing a hymn of glory to the Lord, venerating the memory of his saints. So we're just about out of time, so I just want to take the next few minutes just to answer any questions that you have. It's, uh, it's, it's highly encouraged not to. It's more appropriate, as you said, thank you for acknowledging that, to not, to not chew the divine presence, but rather to allow the Lord to dissolve and just, what's, and what's the rush, right? We just received the presence of God, so what's the rush? Why not keep him there for a significant period of time and allow him to dissolve so that we can offer our prayers to him? And of course, when we consume him, he continues to be present as we continue to acknowledge that he's there. But uh, I would highly encourage not chewing the, the host, no. It's an ex- the word that's used was a, an expression of the more literal, physical way that we are receiving our Lord, but it's not something that's calling us to action in that regard. Mm-hmm. She was talking about a, ma- a, a, a satanic black mass that took place, that was going to take place in Harvard some years ago. But the actual mass was offered to atone for that sacrilege and we rose up against that and therefore it was canceled. Yes. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you all for attending. We have one more question. They don't. It it appears, it appears as, it may appear as leavened bread, but it's not, uh, it's it's not leavened bread because if they're using it, like, uh, like in the Orthodox Church, if they're using it, it would be invalid, but uh, the Orthodox, they do have valid sacraments, so therefore they would be using unleavened bread. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. May Almighty God bless you all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you again, everyone. I'll see you next week. <laughs>